All right, the first question we have from Viviana Mick is how do you identify what should be included and turned into value into a value stream versus what's outside of a value stream? Yeah, I think this, uh, this, this has been an interesting topic as I see organizations get into this. And I think that there has been some confusion. I think one of the, the key things I've noticed that really helps is to have a sense of what your portfolio value streams is. And the, the way organizations tend to tackle this is, you know, the, there'll be a sort of more top-down look at, okay, you know, do, do we map value streams onto uh, system, you know, our, our systems of engagement, our products, our SKUs, our existing portfolio of applications? And I think there, there are a few principles that I've found are really beneficial on this. Because, you know, fundamentally, we know that in the end, value streams are, you know, need to deliver value to, to a customer. That could be an internal customer or an external customer. And so these product value streams are really around the work that a set of a, a team of teams, so a set of teams can produce and deliver to a customer. So in the end, value streams and software are, are, are people. And those people need to do work that's meaningful for that customer. Now, they could be producing a, an insurance application. They could be producing a, a healthcare application. They could be producing an internal platform that's leveraged by many other developers. But fundamentally, that, that value stream is the end-to-end -end set of people delivering that work. And so that means that people from uh, it, it involved in representing the customer, people from the business representing strategy or management, people operating the software, understanding the, the feedback uh, from the customer, all of those people should make up the value stream. And so these things are, are horizontal constructs. They, they will often span your org chart. But basically, the in, a, in, more, in companies who've been born more as, as technology companies, they'll actually be much more aligned, typically, to the org chart as, as well. But of course, there'll, there'll, there'll be some matrixing going on. But it really is that end-to-end -end flow of value from the business, the customer, to, to running software. And I think it really is helpful to think about it as, as a set of teams and as the set of people involved, right? So where I've seen things go sideways is when you've got a, uh, a value stream that's, that's just com composed of technology, technology that's just composed of people and, and the, the business side the only really interacts or leadership only really interacts with it every quarter let's say and that's that, that's really an anti-pattern right because the, the whole point of this is that you're thinking about all of the different stakeholders you're not trying to embed all of the different stakeholders needed onto a single team a single feature team that's generally too hard to have a completely cross-functional team that's too much work to produce a large you know a large uh, chunk of, of the business's value through a single team. But this team of teams level construct, the, the product value stream, is where you need all that cross-functional work and talent and thinking and, and collaboration. So you know, fundamentally, it's you know, the value stream is then composed of, of, of all, the, all the teams doing that work uh, and includes all of the intake to that work. So all of even if it's even if you're you know, what you're doing is funding projects still right it's all the project intake it's all the roadmaps uh, it's all the unplanned work that might be coming through your service desks and um, and and customer feedback or or regulatory or needs or comply you know compliance and audits and so on so it's all of that work and the value stream is it self functions as a unit as an intake for that work uh, that you optimize the flow of and uh, and it produces a, a result and often the, the challenge is is as you're of course, as you're shifting to, to product value streams and the product, uh, the structures that you're working with, and those might be that they'll, they'll be the org chart, they'll be the, the way that your software is architected, uh, they'll be the way that the you know, planning happens and, pro and funding and of projects might still happen, uh, it is not quite aligned to value streams. So it's, it's just this ongoing journey of bringing more and more to the value stream to make it more and more autonomous and independent and be able to function independently with fewer, with the fewest number of external of dependencies on other parts of the organization. So, and then actually then to do that, the key thing is, uh, and I think this is a, a super interesting pitfall is forgetting that, that those dependencies will often be on, on what in a company that's, that's made the shift will be well-defined and clear internal product value streams. So those are the, the platform value streams, the shared services, uh, the, the kind of sh you know, shared components, uh, data pipelines, and so on. And so you can't quite get this right. You end up putting too much into a single value stream because we know, for example, that 
uh, if a value stream has more than 10 agile teams on it, it's too much. It gets too hard to coordinate that many teams, right? Google doesn't, doesn't put more than 10 teams, you know, than a hundred people on search. So you know, basically 10 times 10. So, because it's the, the coordination costs just get too high. So what you really want is to make sure that any, any dependencies of that product value stream, let's say that product value stream is you know, producing an, an insurance application. Uh, it'll actually have dependencies on, on you know, many, many internal things, many uh, internal systems. And you really want to formalize that, those as their own first class product value streams. And those are the, the, the platform value streams. So. Awesome, you touched on that a little bit, but the next question we have from David is how important have you found lean value stream mapping when transitioning to product value streams? Should this be done as a baseline to measuring value delivery? Yeah, this is a good question. And it's, you know, my, I don't love value stream mapping. <laughs> so I'll be, I'll be honest. I, I actually think that, so the, the practice is, th there's a reason for it. I actually do, in terms of conceptually, it's great. The way I feel like it's been applied in software is a problem. So the challenge is, is that if, if value stream mapping is this isolated exercise, and I almost always see it as this isolated exercise, by the time you're done, it's completely wrong and it's stale and things, you know, and things change. So I think the, you know, like, like many others, I think I've, I've gotten a lot of inspiration from the book, learning to see on the value stream mapping, but I think we need to apply that uh, through in a way that makes sense for software and digital. And the fact that what's happening with, with software and with teams is that, that the software is always changing, the work that our teams are doing is always changing. And, and we basically need a, a way of doing live and, and basically digital value stream mapping. Because otherwise, again, the value stream maps go, go stale instantly. So I can't, and just the number of times I've started working with, a, with an organization who's got PowerPoints or Visio or, or whiteboard screenshots of the value stream maps that are really not producing much value because, again, they, they get over. And the other, now, the other thing I should also mention is that these value streams are really complex. So um, my view on this is that the, the value streams need to be, the, product, the value streams need to be defined and they need to be managed. Uh, so, and I think the key thing is that they, they sit in the layer above your tool chain. So you've got your agile tools, your service management tools, your project and product management tools, uh, your DevOps tools and so on. And all those tools are, are really helpful for basically all of the different teams and specialists working on particular value streams, but they actually tend, the shape of those tools, the projects that you have in Jira and Azure DevOps, they, they really tend to match up to the software architecture, not to the, the, the flow of business value uh, it, that, that we're trying to represent value streams. So I think the key thing is to find a way to basically you know, have a, a live representation of your value streams somehow. And that really needs to sit above your tool chain. So, you know, from a commercial point of view, I'll just, you know, it's, this, is, this, is, this is what TaskTap does, right? This is what we've created as, as a way of, of mapping live and active value streams. And so that's one solution. Other solutions are just, you know, to, to build it yourself. But the key thing is just define and manage those value streams on something uh, more live and more representative than, than, than PowerPoint, so. Great. And there's a question in the chat a little bit about that, Nick, that are, you know, are there any value stream templates per se? Yeah. And that, so I don't mean to knock these things like, you know, do, like use Miro, use PowerPoint, like get, get your organization thinking value streams. That's helpful. It's just, it's helpful for the start of the journey. And, and what irks me is when people think it's, it's the end of the journey and everything just snaps back to the old way of doing things. So where the value streams are not managed, they're not defined, the capacity, one of the great outcomes of, of the business understanding and leadership understanding what the value streams are is that capacity becomes clear, right? You, you know what, uh, if you've got a well-defined value streams at a team of teams level, you know what the capacity of the value stream is and you know when in the flow metrics, uh, if the flow load goes too high, the capacity of teams actually declines, right? So if you've got that well-defined and understood when you're doing your, your road mapping, your release planning, your PI planning, you actually have uh, an effective and accurate model of capacity. If you don't, what's happening on the business planning side is it's just, it's all wishful thinking. And so it's so it's very easy to actually overload all these teams with asking them to change, asking them to deliver more, asking them to take down their backlogs because there's no meaningful view of what the capacity of this, of this product value stream is. And the challenge is that that, that PowerPoint uh, won't give you that, that live view of capacity. So I think, you know, 
don't, and I, you know, I think, I think it is an important start of the journey. Just, just make sure it's not the end of the journey because again, they go stale, they're wrong and they don't, they don't, they can't produce flow metrics for you. And, you know, frankly, in, in manufacturing is the same thing, right? It's right now today, it's, it's not the value stream map that's, uh, th that's so important. It's actually the, the digital simulation of the factory that's so important for identifying bottlenecks and understanding if adding this particular automation or robot will actually accelerate things or it'll be unforeseen issues. So I think we, we just have to take a, a, you, know, a, a, you know, a software and data uh, based approach to mapping and understanding our value streams. And I think the main thing is just, just make sure that you're doing that across the tool chain, not just within a single tool, however you do it. So. Awesome. Next question we have is how do you clearly relate the flow metrics to the business values being defined by business owners? So, yeah, that, I think that's an, that's another interesting one. I think there's, there are two key things here. And by the way, I would love to get you know, more live questions as well. Thank you for all the, all the people who sent all these great questions ahead of time, but you know, please feel free to interrupt, chime in, unmute, all those things, um, or just, just post in the chat. Uh, this is, this is definitely a topic I've been uh, focusing more on the, the past couple of years. And I think there are two key things. One is that the flow metrics themselves need to be considered as, you know, as, a, as a key result, as an objective. So what's, what's been happening is a lot of organizations, when they look at their, and of course, in the end, we're all about outcomes, right? We're about business outcomes and customer outcomes, things like such as driving more revenue, better net promoter scores for our, our product, more innovation, uh, more new features delivered to customers and, and so on. And the challenge with, with and in the flow framework, that's the top right, right? These are the business outcomes that you define, however you're actually working on them. You know, we at Tastop use OKRs, a bunch of our customers are moving to OKRs as few tech companies does, but it doesn't really matter. You can use some, you know, some kind of KPI, some kind of quarterly business review process. Somehow those, those business outcomes are actually, are, they're understood. They're already being tracked and managed. So it's a question of how to effectively connect the work happening in technology to those outcomes. And the challenge uh, with some of those, some of the business outcomes is it's, there's, there's a long lag before we actually see how investment in technology drives that business outcome. So, you know, how long does it take for a technical debt investment to drive a business outcome? Which of course is because of that lag, we often see uh, the business, unless you've got some enlightened leaders, not sufficiently who've, who've been burned by tech debt before, uh, which is often how they get enlightened. Um, you've got, you've often got a lack of prioritization for that kind of work because it doesn't correspond directly to a, a tangible business outcome or a cut, and it actually doesn't often respond to a, a direct customer outcome when you're investing in tech debt, investing in platform work and so on. And this is where the flow metrics are really intended to help, right? Where you can actually state that they're a leading indicator of the benefit that you get from investing in technology. So just as one example, uh, we, I often encourage customers to, to take flow time, right? And to make flow time actually be one of your main objectives so that every single product value stream has an objective. If it's flow time, so the time to value and turn into the value stream is over two weeks, which it almost always is in, in, uh, in enterprise IT organizations, to make sure that it's, you, you're shortening it. Because if everyone is focusing on shortening flow time, of reducing flow time, reducing basically time to market or, or time to value, uh, and, and that itself becomes an objective, more work is happening uh, and getting to the customer faster. And all of that new business value that's being delivered is actually driving whatever the stated business outcome might be, like such, such as a better net promoter score. Now you'll get into situations, by the way, where you're doing all this feature work, you've actually gotten flow time short enough, you're doing all this great feature work, uh, and, and the net promoter score, the customer in, engagement scores are not improving. And then you might have a design problem, you might have a product management problem, you might have a kind of a market problem, uh, but, but usually that's not the case, right? Usually you, there are a lot of systems in place to make sure that what you're designing, what you're delivering is meaningful to the customer. Uh, you've got a hypothesis that delivering more of that will, will drive more of that, um, that engagement, uh, more conversions, more re better retention and so on. And so really the bottleneck is how much value you can deliver. And so picking a flow metric as, uh, as a leading indicator of that business outcome can be, you know, can be very, very effective. 
because you get you get very fast feedback on whether you're reducing flow time. That's something that in many organizations, you, you know, you just reduce work in progress, reduce flow load. You'll see flow time improve in two to four weeks, right? When when the team gets a chance to to stop starting work and start finishing work, and and it's less overloaded. So that's a, it, basically that's one way, and I think that's that's really key. And that, and it's they're they're depending on the nature of the value stream, uh, and it's you know it's bottlenecks and. Uh, you basically set a different flow metric. So, you know, take uh, take a value stream that's actually you know inundated of some legacy problems, some integration problems, and those kinds of things. You might simply want to take a, a and, and you get that you have a sense that there's a lot of technical debt, so you want to pri prioritize the debt work. Uh, and you know, the way that that we do that is to basically say, well, debt should increase future flow, and that's something that the business should understand is that we if we invest in Technical debt work in this release cycle, feature work, so our ability, you know, to make a you know a better user experience on a, on a mobile or web application will actually improve in the next release cycle. So you get this very simple hypothesis: is if we that the business you know, can understand, if we prioritize feet, uh, technical debt work this cycle, our flow velocity for features we expect to increase by, you know. 8% or meaningfully or whatever uh, in the next release cycle. And so you can use these flow metrics as, as basically leading indicators of delivering value to market that helps the entire value stream focus on a lot of the things that, you know, that us, you know, the, the technologists realize are important, which is balancing, you know, feature work, debt work and so on. So, and then of course there, I think the key thing that flow distribution is key here. Like the a call earlier this week, um, I was asked, you know, well, I don't know. We, our biggest problem in release planning is that we have some it's a financial services company. We have some regulatory issues, and you know, mid mid release cycle, we'll have an audit, and all this unplanned work happens. So again, making sure that you're using flow distribution to actually effectively plan for unplanned work, because if you if you know you've got an audit happening this quarter or next quarter, uh, you should actually allocate more flow distribution of that product value stream to unplanned risk work because something will come up and the organization needs to know less feature work is getting done this release. There's, there's just no question. We have that audit. We need to see the outcome of that audit. And we know, we know we're going to, you know, I don't know, we're implementing SOC 2. We know there's going to be a lot of work that comes out of what we need to do there. We don't know exactly how much, but, but we need to add, assign capacity for that risk work. So it's really, you know, the, the, where the flow metrics are super useful is balancing that, balancing so that the, the need and desire to deliver for the business to the customer with the reality of the technology work and, and this other kind of work that we need to do, like uh, uh, risks and debts and, and, and defects. So, wow, a lot of good questions now. Okay, good luck, Laurel, please go through these. Yeah, Greg, <laughs> I can't read them all. Greg, would you like to ask your question live and then Juan and Drew and Andreas, if you'd like to unmute, um, you can do that, or if you'd like me to read, I can read. Great. Thanks. Uh, Mick, can you hear me? Yeah. Great, great. Um, regarding the uh, the leading and lagging, indica uh, lagging indicators, which I, I definitely am I'm in sync with the, uh, the flow time as being one of, uh, a, a key leading indicator. Could you maybe mention one other flow-based leading indicator that you think is valuable, you know, useful to, to get folks thinking about this, and possibly one or two lagging indicators, just to kind of put a, a framing yeah. around flow so folks can, can consume it like quickly. Yeah, absolutely. And so, and then there's a question with all these leading and lagging indicators is, is what it's a leading and lagging indicator of. So what I've been focused on is leading and lagging indicators of, of, a, of a business metric, a business outcome, right? Like yeah. when, the, when you want a leading indicator for whether, whether how you're tracking to increasing, uh, I'll just use the customer net promoter score example. So that's a you know that's a business outcome you're after. Of course, that business outcome might have then have a follow-on business outcome like more better revenue, um, winning more of the market, and so on. But let's 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 just take that one. So flow velocity of features is a leading indicator of of driving a net promoter score because the the more features you can deliver, the the better the engagement for the customer, right? That's that's how digital products win is is by providing uh, better features. Now, sometimes those features, not, not, it's not always more features. Often it is more features, but but improvements in the design of those features. Basically, the more the more that you're delivering in terms of net new business value in that product, uh, the better engagement with that product uh, will be. So, flow velocity is of features is absolutely a. 
uh, a leading indicator of um, uh, of 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 driving engagement and and the success of a product. Gotcha. Um, any any thoughts on lag? Gotcha. Because yeah, flow time and flow velocity that those yeah. make sense as as leading and knowing that leading indicators could become lagging indicators. Or, you know, lagging indicators are those lateral yeah. ones. A any yeah. lagging indicators that that you also you 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 see from a flow yeah. perspective. Yeah, I mean, so flow load is a lagging indicator of the team's gotcha. overload, but a leading indicator of, of future drops in productivity, which you can measure in flow efficiency. So if you see, we see flow load go up, and this is the thing, these flow metrics by design are, are just meant to basically look at this dynamic system of a value stream, right? So yep. it really is all, I, I do see this as kind of this kind of whack-a-mole of, of dynamics. And so let's say, the, the team was the team was overloaded with with too much work. Um, so there, and this is one of the most common things we see right now. So they're being asked to go through some agile or DevOps transformation. Uh, they're given no capacity for any improvement work. The backlogs have not changed any. And so what happens is, and the capacity of the teams are, are, is not understood on top of that, right? So this is a situation we we, we regularly see, which is why I I I, uh, I raise it so often. Um, so basically you've got so that's happened and the and the and the flow load going up is a lagging indicator of that overload the overloads all, already happened at that point the team is thrashing people are unhappy um the and then it's a you know that's a leading indicator of flow efficiency dropping because the more the teams are context switching and switching between different tasks the more dealing they're dealing with different dependencies the more meetings are happening and so on and so then flow efficiency starts dropping and flow efficiency dropping is a leading indicator for, for flow velocity dropping. And then flow velocity dropping tends to be the leading indicator for some business, out, some problem, some business outcome. Gotcha. So, yeah. Now, it, it's interesting, right? Because we see, so happiness is a, is a metric, one of the metrics on the top right of the flow framework. Uh, and, and that tends to be a leading indicator for problems with, with architecture or dependencies. Yeah. So, so. Yeah, it's the yeah. I I hope that answers your question. But yeah, it's basically it's it's these dynamics that we often see, and especially you can really watch them in play over the course of and it's neat because over the course of weeks when and I think you know the best part is actually when you've got you know you look for, what I do when I look for the leading indicator that will improve some other you know, some other metric right. Yeah. So if we can reduce whip, if we can reduce the flow load, uh, we then expect. Um, uh, flow velocity go up because we were stopping overload people we were starting to overload the teams yeah. and we can now see that they can stop starting and start finishing so Thank you. you know this was good yeah this this created that that kind of that common thread from say some of those tactical indicators like whip not that it's not strategic but it's kind of tactical yeah. to business outcomes with this yeah. idea of flow indicators in the middle of that yeah definitely create a good connection no i appreciate it Thank yeah you. And and that's really the crux of doing, I think, doing effective planning around the the objectives and and the results that you track on your value streams, the the business outcomes that you tr track, is that it's okay for them to be lagging indicators because it's hard for them not to be because it involves actually you know, the customer getting the software, doing something with it, and so on. As long as you've got leading indicators that that you're watching in conjunction with those. And then, of course, again, it's like that example of features not, you know, feature delivery not moving the needle for a product because you've already lost in the market or something of that sort. Um, it should have you question your entire roadmap at that point. So, thank you. Excellent. Um, Chris, would you like me to read your question, and would you like to unmute or now ask yours? Yeah. So, um, I was struggling, or sometimes we are struggling to identify value streams as they are in the company. And as of course, as, as someone with, with as a agile coach, you have an idea and and of course we know everything better. That's always right. No. Seriously, it's it's difficult to, to, to see where are really the problems next and stuff. And I was thinking um, maybe to set as a message that everyone can understand where the, what the value stream actually is, whether it's possible like like when you have such a that documentary for, for kids where you just where you where you see a production lines usually the camera is focusing on the same item as, as the whole production line along. And I was thinking whether we can do something like that together with a PMO and really just look at one specific uh, feature or epic in our production, yeah. in our development line 
and see, okay, now it's in software development. Now, oh, now it, it's back in hardware. Now it's back software again. Oh, regulatory, and yeah. and that we that we really see and and identify what the value stream is, rather than just sitting in a meeting room and 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 discussing about PowerPoint slides because this is so uh, exhausting. <laughs> Yeah, Andres, I, I think that's that's a great visual, and I think that that's that's that really is how I think about it. And and actually, a lot of our work on this and a lot of the flow framework came from from analyzing and visual, visualizing exactly that. So kind of you know you know your metaphor of you know you know something going through an assembly line, like a Lego brick going all the way from you know a, a foundry all the way to being packaged up in a in a plastic bag. Um, so that's exactly how we look at it. I think it's it's really you know what what was the entire life cycle of that business epic, and so I, I've seen these. We 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 regularly look at these at these visualizations of that you know again that that feature that business epic. How did it flow? And in the end, by the way, the, the interesting thing is, um, if you sort of if you can map if you map that out in aggregate, and when we do our our visualizations of it, you will see that there's these you know the, the, these these things cluster up, right? That the teams that are basically where you've got more value being delivered, it does tend to be this the, the, the de facto value stream, right? Teams, or they kind of self-organize around this way anyway, anyone who's, who's getting anything done. So it really is around um, having that perspective is that these value streams exist, right? They're, they're happening today. They just might be overly inefficient. And some of those Lego bricks might have four week wait states where they shouldn't because they're waiting on input from someone. Um, and so it's really you know, understanding those flows. On, and I think you know, the, the, the bricks that are most appealing to people are the business epic, are the big mm -hmm. business epics, are the, are the big features. Uh, and, and then basically helping the organization create a, a, a communication structure and a team structure that, that just optimizes the, the flow of those, of those widgets. So now, of course, the widgets, the interesting thing, I think one of the points of project product is that it's not a linear flow because sometimes you know, someone, something will go, go into development and then, you know, the, the performance profile of the widget that was designed doesn't quite match or the teams would have to go get a new JavaScript framework to actually make it a school of visualization as, as was desired. So we'll go back into some UX design. And so these things loop. Sometimes, you know, something you'll realize something's an API feature request. So it'll actually move between value streams before you can work on it again. So it's, it's a complex flow, but, but it really is that. And I think recognizing that, that those flows are already there in the organization and then helping the communication architecture, the team structure um, uh, align to those and the software architecture align to those value streams. I think that's, that's the journey, so. Do you, have, do you have some coping strategy? Because I think uh, it, when I talk to other developers, everyone is, understands this that, and also the iterative flow in, during development. But I think as the value stream doesn't end when R&D is finished. The value stream ends when the customer has the Lego pick. Yeah. And, and we have usually, or at least in my experience, we, have, we see these organizations where we have regulatory and, and new product engineering where we, and stuff, and yeah. which is all also part of the value stream. Yeah. And, but we, 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 when, when people like start to analyze value streams, we very often stop at, at R&D and then it's done. And, and that's that's I think that's not the goal to stop at R&D. So we live in a yeah. hybrid world where we have value stream oriented R&D right now, at yeah. least in my company. And then we have this still project focused, project based yeah. organization. And this is actually like everyone can think themselves yourself. Uh, it's 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 a a cause of conflict. Yeah, and by the way, I you know the way I look at that is like let's we have that project based work and take. That's not if you're in that kind of organization. We have let's say if you're in an organization that, that builds hardware physical products, we're using a V model like and that's there. Let's also make sure that that we visualize that work and that we understand its flow time and we understand that it's six months. And and so if we're constrained to that being six months, let, you know let's look at how we can innovate faster here because we now all of a sudden have a more powerful processor on our on our hardware platform or something. Um, so I think, I mean, back to your original point, Andres, it's like the, the, the children's movie. Uh, 
Laurel, we should, we, we actually tried to make, like Naomi, one of our staff, Naomi, tried to make a children's movie version of this. We actually see these things moving on, a, on an assembly line and it was, it, it was really powerful. So maybe let's, let's send that out to the group at some point because it was really meant to communicate what value management was at that level. And, and I think, Anders, it, it is really important that, that various stakeholders understand it, it's not done until the software is running, whether it's in the cloud, on a device, in a car, it's not done until that point. Right, uh, so you're not getting feedback. You've not delivered the result to the customer, and you really need to look at that end, the end-to-end -end thing. And I think the key thing is, uh, it can be you know it can feel daunting sometimes to organizations to say, okay, uh, you know, we need to we need to uh, basically get two week flow time across everything. And 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 you don't. You just need to understand what which value streams do we need very fast flow time to have a fast feedback loop. And which ones are actually stuck with some constraints? That means whether it's the way that project work is structured, the way that we have hardware constraints, those will fundamentally take longer. Let's focus on making these ones where engagement with the customers is most important or where this is a core part of our platform. Let's make sure that those, that's where we focus on getting the really fast flow time. So a, a part of visualizing this is, is to me is actually accepting which product value streams can have longer flow time and where six months is okay. And we're going to leave that alone while we focus on making sure we have fast flow time over here. But actually having that uh, that well defined, and this is why I actually always encouraging having the the flow metrics OKR set on each value streams on each value streams and and understood and measured. Because again, sometimes months are okay. It's just you, the teams need to recognize that it's months, and the software teams need to recognize they're not getting a new hardware update for X months or a hardware a requirement fixed in hardware for that period of time. Because it's, it's those dependencies of having one thing move really fast, one thing move really slow that, that, that really hurt you. But if that's well-defined and understood uh, at this kind of product value from portfolio level, then the teams can adjust accordingly, so. <laughs> the children's movie out. Yeah, we have to get, I, it, it was a, Laura, you remember the one, right? It's a couple of years ago. It is. It was. It was effective, right? Because, and this is part of the. This is. I think we, we should all be doing more on this front because, um, it's visualizing this can be hard. Like Andres, you said that, right? So it's like a Lego. You know, it's like a, a business epic moving along an assembly line, right? It's that can be hard because these are intangible things, and this is why, with a flow framework, one of the goals is just like it just features defects for syntax. You just need to understand those four. Now, the way those four break down by the time teams work on them is actually quite complex, as we know, right? But, but yeah, I think the key thing is helping the organization understand what, you know, what's, what, what done is and, and, you know, have a, a sort of this kind of visualization. So yeah, we'll get that out, so. Excellent, Juan or Drew, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Would you like me to read them? Happy to do it either way. Sure, so, um, you know, first of all, like I read your book a few years ago, like definitely transformative, especially as an enterprise agile coach. Um, so thank you for that. But um, where I am today is at a scale up. And, uh, you know, we're a much smaller organization, right? And, and uh, um, the core tenet of what I'm trying to bring to this organization is the idea to, as we're scaling up, avoid the pitfalls that uh, organizations that don't have the advantage of, of uh, being born digital, right? Mm -hmm. Have. And so a lot of the material that I'm finding out there um, in the tooling really focuses more on, you know, moving the mountain that is, you know, older um, legacy enterprise organizations. Um, yeah. And what would you say from a uh, flow metrics perspective, like where, where to look and start from uh, information? Because I really do want to uh, bring flow metrics to um, to where we are right now uh because there's so much benefit to focusing on the total volume of flow as opposed to yeah to work within it yeah and so yes i think it's you know certainly a lot of my focus a lot of the focus out there has been on these large enterprise it organizations and uh because that's you know the problems are so severe there and but, but the bottom line is, I think, like like you're saying, Drew, all of this applies to, to startups, to scale ups, and, and to others. So I think that you know, I know at at Tastop, you know, we use, obviously we we use our the value stream management for 
all of our solutions. We review the flow metrics with our board. We and you know we we look at actually where there's these opportunities to invest, where we have the largest bottlenecks, and and this changes you know effectively every month, every quarter. So I think the you know the main thing is you just have some way of mapping out this view, right? Like the way I'd look at it, you, you know, you've got the agile tools. I would say, you know, if you, you're using Jira, using Azure DevOps or something, don't overdo it. Don't make everyone always, you know, those teams like to have their, their finer grained work breakdown with their issue types, but figure out a way. Yeah, and here's how I would start actually, just get it into release planning, right? So get into your road mapping and, and, and start by saying, okay, every release we have to, we have to deliberately assign the amount of flow that's going to features, defects, risks, and debts. And of course, in the end, we're, we're trying to deliver more and more features, but let's be very deliberate around that. And at least at a theme level, of course, ideally, like you're seeing the actual flow uh, with a solution at, at the actual you know, flow item level. So this is all live in real time. Um, but at least at this, at this thematic level of your, you know, the, the biggest chunks of work, which should appear in your agile or your product management tool, uh, your, each one of those big chunks of work and these are the, the features, the business epics, the, the, the bigger things uh, that have multiple user stories mapping into them. Um, uh, you're tracking the balance of features, defects, risks, and bets. And so I think you know, that can be a great place to start. And then yeah, you know, we can certainly follow up with, uh, with how you can take a next step around that. But I, I do find it really powerful to, to get it into the, the road mapping and release planning process. So. Because it gets you know people again thinking deliberately about this. People thinking deliberately about okay, when are we going to you know we said we, we like you know you're a scale up. You just had a big push to market on 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 releasing something, and it, it makes a very uh, deliberate and explicit discussion of when are we going to pay off that technical debt that we incurred to in that push to market. Is it this quarter? Is it next quarter? We've got to do it some sometime. So yeah, I just say as a, as a start, bring it into your your release planning and road mapping process and then you know revisit that at, at least monthly so or review that at least monthly so awesome thank you excellent juan would you like to ask your question yes um for me it's how to start the the main question how to start a value stream from which end do i start from the end where i generate value in the hands of the end user and starting from them to from right to left or, for, or from the other side. So starting, okay, there's an idea and then I go to, to the market and to see what is the, the, the best way to start because currently I'm struggling in, in a project, how to, to, to be efficient uh, and, and what is the best way to, so that I get not, where we get not lost in an endless discussion and, uh, and uh, yeah. So what is the, what is your view and what is your recommendations or what is your idea and experience um, on, on that, how to start a, a value stream mapping. Yeah. So again, I think this is where it gets, it's easy to get stuck, but this is where, again, unless you're starting from scratch, it's, it's already there to some degree, right? There's already a, a, a SKU that's being sold. There's already a product. There's already something being delivered to a client or something of that sort, right? So I think the key thing is, is definitely you know, to start with what's there from a business and the customer perspective. Mm -hmm. And then to really look at uh, what are all the teams and people involved in delivering this thing? That's a value stream. It might be the most inefficient one in the world, but but there's a value stream there, right? It might be project aligned, not product aligned, but but there's a value stream there. So it's it's to really look at from because in the end, remember these value streams. And I think this this can be helpful because there's so many ways of structuring it. And yeah, I've seen I've seen the organization take okay. Well, these 350 applications that we have, that's one value stream. Is it? Is it? Maybe I don't know. Like how many of those are actually live? How many are in maintenance mode? Um, so just the key thing to keep in mind is that value streams are fundamentally around, about pull. Right, they're not about the top level planning, they're around what's being pulled by, by the customer. So, and in the end, the way that we prioritize work um, and the way that we you know, decide what to do and, and how to invest is, is in support of that pull. 
So customers, external customers, again, they pull features, they want new value and they pull quality improvements. They want a, they want a robust and safe experience. And so you can, you know, you start back, start with the end, start with a customer, say, say, what are they pulling? What are we delivering? How is that driving a, a business outcome? And then, and can, you know, that's the value stream sort of all the way up to the, you know, to the business. So that, that's how you map it out. But, but I think the key thing is do start with the notion of pull and look at everything it took to get that there. And then, you know, again, you've got this kind of, you've got this loop of, of flow and feedback. So the, because I think, you know, too often what happens is, is it's, and this is a challenge with project management, it's everything is defined up front. So it's, it's like this, like, you know, six or 12 month push of value to a customer and you don't have that feedback to become iterative because in the end, what you're trying to do for every value stream is just to create a feedback loop, you know, an, an UDA, observe, orient, decide, act loop with the business and, and all their stakeholders involved. So, yeah. So, you know, think pull and think of establishing that feedback loop that did this where you've got feedback from the customer. And, and do keep in mind that this is, again, a lot of these value streams will be supported by internal value streams where you're build, building a data platform, an analytics platform underneath that as well. And what's the pull like for that? Because so often those internal platforms, they don't have a roadmap, right? In the end, they kind of aggregate, uh, uh, view of the pull is it's what's gone on to the roadmap for the product. Every single internal product needs its own roadmap too, right? It needs its own value stream defined. It needs to understand whether it delivered the APIs that the that the business facing products needed or not. So, and that's where often people get stuck. Is again, as I mentioned at the start, is those internal product value streams. You need to formalize and define those too, and it makes the whole thing easier. So, okay, thank you. Cheers. Excellent. Our next question um, is from Dekop in the chat. He might have some audio issues, so I'm going to read it out. How can developers, testers, and other frontline workers in the trenches of software delivery best handle situations where management seems blissfully unaware of the importance of flow and project versus product concepts, and the business simply continues tossing features over the wall to get delivered? Sorry, I was reading another question. <laughs> Greg, Greg M, sorry. Um, can you repeat that, Laurel? Sure. How can, how can developers, testers, and other frontline software de delivery workers best handle situations where management seems blissfully unaware of the importance of flow and project versus pro product concepts, and the yeah. business simply continues tossing features over the wall to get it delivered? Yeah, and I think this is, this is a key question. This is a question none of us will stop answering anytime soon. Um, and uh, it's, it's, I think it's really to relate it back to, to economic outcomes and business outcomes, right? Is to make a clear case, and ideally with data, to say what, when we throw things over the fence, they take longer to get out. They take longer to get to the customer. We ignore technical debt and our flow efficiency goes down even, even lower. So um, the most effective way I've seen this done, at, especially at large scales, is is actually with flow efficiency it's just you know, when we operate in this mode our flow efficiency goes down because the flow load thing is very abstract oftentimes to, to business leaders right it's like you know what's flow load even though you know if, if anyone's ever been in manufacturing it's it's very obvious right as you overload the manufacturing line you get less cars out not more um so so I think the key thing is like flow efficiency has this feels like when it's when it's really going down when you're into like 20, 10% of less on flow efficiency, that gives, uh, I think, leadership a palpable feeling. It's like, wow, our productivity is that low and we've got competitors who might be at 50 or 60%. How do we fix this? And it's when they become interested in fixing that, then you can actually, you can actually start making these economic cases where if we reduce the overload on the teams, if we actually understand and measure and plan to the team's capacity and stop overloading them, we'll get more out, not less. And our flow time will increase, which means you'll stop worrying about where the feature is, and you'll actually, you know, you'll have received two or three features in, in the same time frame, and you'll stop changing scope on the teams, which further increases their their flow load. Um, so, I think it's it, it really is all about making that economic case around something that that's tangible to them in the end, which is, in you know, you know, which has to do with productivity and velocity, right? Like everyone, oftentimes leadership and stakeholders really, really do want to accelerate how much they're bringing to market, how quickly they're transforming, how much value is being delivered. But the challenge is, is that they've grown up around, you know, 
economics of scale, not not these economies of flow. So it's I think it's there's also this this is why we have the Flow Institute as well is to always help and it's it's on flowframework.org. So um, I think it's it's just an ongoing education process of the fact that you, you can't you cannot ignore flow if you're if you're responsible for business outcomes. And I guess the benefit of that is if you understand these dynamics and, and then work with the teams on these dynamics, again, you'll get, you'll, you'll get more out of it, right? It's, it's actually, and, then, and this is, a, I think this is the key thing is, um, is that as soon as you start seeing, as soon as things start improving, as soon as can, you kind of make this case around flow and things start getting better and there was a couple extra features delivered or there was, you know, the, um, something was brought to market faster than it was previously, uh, and I re I actually highly recommend this the podcast with Peter Jordan from Tui uh, that went on on the project product org uh, website and podcast last week I think or two weeks ago uh, he is celebrating those successes and making those successes tangible and palpable and recognizing them as key right because as soon as as soon as things start improving and they started improving because the the, the, the dynamics of flow were understood. And there was some space given to the teams or some autonomy given the teams to, to do some of the right things and support from leadership. As soon as that produces a positive outcome, all of a sudden the, the, the conversation changes, right? Because oftentimes there'll be a year, two, three, four of things feeling like they're slowing down. As soon as th things start feeling like they're slowing up and it looks like you know, the data starts showing that they're speeding up, even if it's, if it's just by a, by a bit, you do tend to get that kind of buy-in and engagement and it creates this, this virtuous cycle, so. Awesome, it looks like we are back to our questions that have come in, but if you have more, please interrupt or put them in the chat. Nick, the next question we have is, what role does the traditional project management office have in the transition to product delivery rather than a project model? Yes, in my experience, when when uh, those when the PMO takes an active role in this, it can be a really important catalyst because you know, fundamentally, the, the the PMO wants to have a sense of how things are you know, of prioritization, how things are being delivered to the business, of having that kind of visibility. And the challenge is that for software, their existing approaches of, of you know, the project management tools don't really work because software is too uncertain, uh, development need, needs to be more iterative, and there's, there's a much faster learning loop, right? It's, it's just too hard to make 18-month plans or 12-month or plans that you can really stick to when technologies and customers and markets keep changing. So, uh, so I think the key thing is to, again, I think this is where the flow metrics are, can be a catalyst. If the, if, the, if the PML views and project managers view the flow metrics as a way of looking through the windshield, not the rearview mirror, of having these leading indicators, um, of understanding that, you know, that, that the importance of some of these dynamics, that if they're, if they're, if they're seeing technical debt ignored too long, uh, that the project delivery for a client could get, you know, they need to assume it, it'll, it'll actually get derailed, right? And the, the targets will be missed. So it's just giving them um, additional visibility in their toolbox, again, of these leading indicators, which, you know, I often see they, they embrace because they, in, in spite the title of the book, it's, it's actually been amazing to see how often in the customers that we work with, uh, uh, the PMO is, is one of the key champions for this, because again, they're charged with, you know, helping, looking for dependencies, looking for um, for allocation issues, but at the same rate, it does require a, um, a different way of thinking for the PMO, right? Because this notion that you can treat people and teams as resources and reallocate them and allocate them to multiple value streams very quickly, you see in Flowmetrics is a, is a disaster, right? As soon as you're allocating a person to multiple teams or product value streams, your flow efficiency tanks. So you need to stop doing that. Um, but again, you need a way, a data-driven way to understand why you need to stop doing it usually. And, uh, and this is why, again, tracking this, I think, is so key. So I think it's, there's definitely a, uh, an education process. But I, what I've seen is just a lot of desire from those teams to, you know, to understand why it's been so difficult to, to track outcomes and, and schedules uh, for software work, for software and digital portfolios. And th this actually gives uh, a, a single vocab a, a vocabulary to do that, that makes sense for both the PMO and for the people on the technology side, so. I 
Excellent. It looks like we have a couple more that just came in the chat. Uh, Jolie, would you like to read yours or would you like me to? All right, I'll take it yep. away. Oh. Yep, go ahead and read it. I couldn't find Sorry, no worries. What are some examples of technical debt in a non-software, non-manufacturing organization? I'm thinking it is the tools used, data storage, collection tools, SharePoint, for example, at a PMO. What would be the technical debt? Yeah, and this is why I actually call it debt, not just technical debt, because, te because technical debt often is associated with code, right? But you've actually got a lot of process debt in organizations. If you've got a lot of handoffs, um, whatever you know, whatever you're delivering, that's that's that will be a form of debt. And automating some of those handoffs or removing some of the handoffs will actually be a way of increasing flow by removing that debt. So I think the key thing is, you know, think of this: the, the debt is anything that was put in place that, in the end, it was either as a shortcut, as a way of you know delivering something, bringing some you know some project or or product to market, um, and and in the end, it it, it impedes flow. So technical debt impedes flow because uh, it's it's the cases where the software architecture is misaligned to flow because of reasons of legacy of shortcuts of all these sorts of things. Um, you'll have value stream debt itself, where let's say you, you're missing automations that you could be using, um, or you've got legacy systems or too many systems, or data needs to be entered into two or three places. Right? That's that's a form of value stream debt where you actually want to. Uh, improve the handoffs and the flow of the value stream. Because in the end, one of the key principles from lean manufacturing value streams is make value flow without interruptions, right? We're trying to remove, remove the wait states. So really think of it as anything that causes wait states. And it's the wait states that are, you know, in, they're the kiss of death to flow. Uh, with technical debt, it's, it's because of, again, our architecture misalignment where too much work has to be done, too much code has to be written. But again, any handoffs, any process issues, um, any long review processes, anything that trigger eight meetings to happen, all of it. So, so there's the organ organizational aspects to that, right? We can have managerial debt where you, you've got to have you know, too many sign offs on something. So, all of those kinds of things. So, wait stages and bottlenecks, primarily kinds of things. Are yes. The cause those okay great yeah exactly and so that's why th th those the investment in debt is in the flow framework is all about increasing future flow and the way that we do that is, is by removing those weight states so oh and really just understanding and the weight states are the each of them is a bottleneck like you'll have the main bottleneck the main constraint you relieve that there'll be another constraint so Awesome. For the sake of time, I'm just going to read the next chat question um, from Greg. When looking at your life cycle of learning what a value stream is or are, it sounds like it's okay to start with some value streams and allowing for them to be combined, combined or refined in some way that a person's health program also adjusts over time. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's a really key point is just, just start and then understand the data, understand the flow, you know, think of it from like what Andrea said earlier, um, as, as how things flow here, and then use that learning to refine and, and refactor what, what the product value streams are. Because in the end, this is an ongoing journey. I know at, at TASTAP, almost every quarter, we're looking at, okay, are our product value streams, that, you know, are, are, we, are things allocated properly? Do we actually need um, more, do, do we move this team from this product value stream to another one? It turns out that's, that's not too hard to do when a, a team is a cohesive unit. So you're, you're basically, you're always trying to optimize for flow, minimize dependencies. And so these value streams are, are, are I think that they always need to be refactored and they should be revisited um, depending on whatever your planning cadence is, but just, you know, just say quarterly. Every quarter you're looking at the data and you're looking at optimizing flow. And sometimes that will mean changes in, kind of in the org chart in responsibilities of, you know, of what part of the organization is delivering what and, and then process improvements, so. Excellent. The next question we have is not all items in a flow will be the same size. Not all features are the same scale of work. How does it affect the inter interpretation of data? Does this matter? Yeah, and so again, the, it's, a, it's a good question and this is a very deliberate choice um, I made with a flow framework is to, and it was, it was I definitely a lot of work and review of data went into this. But the key thing is to make this 
make this simpler. Like, let's go back to Andreas's, uh, you know, children's video. We, we want this to feel tangible and to look tangible, right? And so just because some of the Lego bricks are really big on the assembly line and some of them are really small, um, that's really important, inf important information, you know, specific to how those bricks were built, but, but not as important in terms of end-to-end -end flow. So the flow framework discards all of the different sizing of the information and just counts the number of flow items. Now, what will happen when you actually do analytics on flow, what you'll see is, uh, if, if you look for a bottleneck and you look at, well, what were the most problematic ones? What were the things that took rework or that bounced back and forth between teams? And you'll often see these really large business epics or things with, you know, 20, like 27 story points on them or something crazy like that. Um, so that information should be there. And I, it depends how, what kind of agile process you're running. I, I know, you know, we certainly use story points uh, so that we can then dig in and understand, okay, well, maybe work wasn't broken down in a fine and great enough way. Maybe we shouldn't have, you know, things with, uh, with 99 story points on them. Um, but, uh, but I think the key thing is at the flow level, that information is, is effectively discarded. And then when you're looking for, for individual bottlenecks, it actually becomes very important. So, so yeah, just think of the, the kind of the flow framework level, that live stream level as a higher level where you're not digging into that level of detail. But the great thing is with all our agile tools and frameworks, all that detail is there. So. Excellent. I think we have time for one more question. Um, I'll keep it on a shorter question is how many value streams is too many value streams? Is there a typical number that you see from your experiences with enterprises? Yeah. So this, this has to do basically with uh, how you can manage organizational communication, right? We know from you know Scrum and Agile that 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 you know teams you kind of want to keep your teams between whatever five and twelve people. Um, so th at that point, if you, the teams grow much bigger, communication becomes becomes problematic. And it's the same thing at the team of teams level. You really want you know chances are you, you don't want to have more than um, than ten teams on a single value stream, and one team can be okay. But, but more than 10 starts becoming problematic from a communication architecture point of view. And so it's really that, those are the units. And so, you know, if you're, I don't know, Amazon, you've got 160 different uh, web services, each with a product value stream composed into programs. So th this concept scales, right? And, and at some point you've got, so you've got your agile teams, you've got your product value streams. If you're big enough, you compose those into programs. If you're big enough, then you, compose those into lines of business and so on. But uh, it's, it's, whatever your, it's, it's whatever the size of your organization needs. But the interesting thing is you know, how, how much can be done actually by one effective value stream, right? Like SpaceX is, is effectively one. It doesn't have that many people. It's delivering all this incredible software. Google, you know, the Google search team is delivering all this incredible software with, a, with a, you know, effectively a, a single value stream that depends on, on many, many um, platform value streams. So, so it's however many you need, but just you know, continue using this as, a, as an organizing principle um, because again, you don't want to end up with a point where you've got uh, like 30 value streams reporting to, to one person. Thanks for the great questions, everyone. <laughs>